Yes, so I'm a Professor of Intensive Care Medicine at UCL. My name's Hugh Montgomery. Um, and there are lots of reasons for being engaged in this, what's generally considered rather fluffy area of, of sustainability, and I'd like to convince you that that's not the case. This is hardcore stuff. The first is, of course, that regardless of what one thinks about the environment, um, the NHS faces substantial fiscal constraints. We're saving over £21 billion in coming years, and this is at a time when demand for NHS services can only go up as the population ages and as te technological and pharmaceutical advances occur. So we're going to face restricted budgets with increasing demand, and that in itself is not sustainable unless something else changes. Now on top of that, we have global, and indeed national, escalation in demands for energy that's been inexorable for decade upon decade upon decade. And furthermore, the availability of the energy supply is getting increasingly constrained. And we've had this debate in the national newspapers and in Parliament about how we increase our energy supplies. So energy costs for the NHS, as for the rest of us, will continue to rise in coming years. That is also not sustainable. Now, on top of that, humanity has grown in numbers from a little over a billion, maybe 125 years ago, to a stage where we're now adding a billion people to the planet's population every 10 to 12 years. Each of those individuals is increasingly using more and more energy, and our demands are also rising inexorably by somewhere between 4 and 6% per year, year on year of late. And this is requiring the burning of a vast amount of fossil fuels. And it's interesting to know that it's only a little over 150 years ago that the first oil well was ever uh, drilled, and that was only 67 feet deep. The first jet aeroplane ticket for commercial use was only sold a little over 50 years ago, and many of you in this audience will be too young to remember, but it was in my teenage years that the first home computer was sold. And that was in 1973. But we now have well over 4 billion passenger flights taken every year. And if one just looks at light bulb use, 126 new light bulbs are sold every second in Europe alone. Burning of all this fossil fuel is driving up carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And that is leading to what's known as global warming. And that sounds rather pleasant. But actually it drives weather instability. And no one in this room will be unaware of the massive increase in weather volatility that we've seen in this country. The rainfall of a month falling in a day. I don't know how many times I've heard that in the last few years. Uh, droughts, sudden cold spells. And this has been mirrored around the world. A fifth of Pakistan underwater a few years ago. Thailand, Vietnam and a lot of Southeast Asia similarly affected. Uh, grain crop collapsing twice in Kazakhstan in the last five years. And most recently, the pressure on grain production in North, in North America with the droughts of last summer. That is also not sustainable. So climate change itself threatens human health for a range of different reasons. Now there's a good news component of this. Not only do we all have a moral obligation then to try to make our health service sustainable and to safeguard the health of our population and to save money and reduce pollution, but all of these things fit together into one neat Venn diagram. If we all save energy, reduce our pollution and our carbon footsteps, that's not only good for energy and climate security, but it's directly good for health quite independently. Why? Well, the why is fairly straightforward. If one looks at low carbon living, it itself is very positively beneficial for health. So substituting active transport, walking and cycling, for driving, for instance, and substituting vegetable and fruit for red meat not only saves on greenhouse gas emissions and being very water and land intensive um, and cars of course burning an awful lot of fossil fuels but the active part of eating healthily and exercising is good for health it reduces the rate of osteoporosis muscle weakness and falls in the elderly strokes heart attacks and peripheral vascular disease hypertension and indeed mild to moderate depression diabetes central obesity and even elements such as cancer, which we normally don't think of in that light. So we've all got an opportunity here to make our quality of life better and to make our NHS sustainable while safeguarding the health of those in this country and around the world. Now, there are lots of ways in which you might want to engage in this agenda, and it's hopefully something that you'll be discussing when I've stopped talking. 
One way is to engage with your local trust. They will be wanting to save a lot of money, and very soon they'll be challenged, I imagine, with sacrificing wards or jobs, or making savings elsewhere, and that's where you can help. So my trust, I work predominantly for my NHS work at the Whittington Hospital, are very much on side for this. And I talked to my estate's lead, and one evening at about 11.30 at night, he took me for a walk around all of the buildings off the ward. So we weren't looking at clinical areas at all. We were horrified, actually, and so was he. Uh, radiators left on everywhere, windows open. And we identified over 700 light bulbs in unused offices, corridors, toilets, cupboards, physiotherapy departments, left on all night. And these are normally burning 24-7. There was a huge cost saving to be made there for the Trust, measured in many tens of thousands of pounds. And you can help in doing just such an energy audit. If you're uh, on your own, I wouldn't suggest you start wandering around buildings late at night, but you can do this safely if you ask your Estates Department, and imagine they would welcome your engagement in that process. But there are other things you can do too. How do you feed the patients and staff in your hospital? What are they eating and where does that food come from? What else can you do to save energy? When one's procuring computers, what's the process for that? Is the green agenda at the absolute top of that procurement process? I hope you'll hear a lot more about this at this meeting, but those are all good reasons for engaging, and I wish you luck in making a difference.